Now, before I introduce Suzanne, I'd like to uh, welcome for the first time to uh, our su support group, um, Dr. Anthony Lowe. Stand up, Anthony, please. Anthony is the CEO of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. So it's great to have you here, Anthony. Thank you very much. Now, this lovely, very competent woman on my left is um, Suzanne Chambers. We uh, are really appreciative of Suzanne coming down from Brisbane today. She's done it specially for us and uh, she's a great supporter of PCFA and all support groups and I'm sure you will be entertained by her very informative talk. Without any further ado, I'd like you to put your hands together for young Suzanne. <laughs> David is such a smoothie, is he not? <laughs> so, well, it's, I have to say, it's just a huge pleasure to be invited here by David and Pam to speak to you. I've known David for many years. I'm not sure how many now. Can you remember, David, when we first met? I'd say at least 10. Yeah, at least 10. And uh, so I thought I'd start by just telling you a little bit about me, you know, why I ended up doing this sort of work, so you sort of know where I'm coming from. And then I've prepared some slides with, which, with some information that um, other men and their partners have told me was helpful. So I thought I'd go through that with you. But I'm a pretty informal person, and so I'm really happy for you to sing it and go, oi, oi, I reckon that's a lot of nonsense or whatever. And uh, because what I find in topics like how to cope and get on with life after prostate cancer, you really often learn the most from talking to each other and hearing what other people have done that, that has worked. So I really encourage you to do that as we go along. So a bit about me, um, not that young anymore, even though David keeps calling me the young Suzanne. Originally I was a registered nurse, that's how my professional career started, and I was a nurse for about 10 years. And then I got into um, studying psychology, really just because um, it seemed interesting and I thought it would help me to do my work better. And so then I ended up qualifying as a psychologist and then from that moving into actually doing research with people with cancer um, about how they cope and what might be helpful. And really only did that because I w was aware that I didn't think what we were doing was perhaps the most helpful things. And I thought that if I talked to more people who were actually experiencing cancer, I would learn more about what that experience is like and that would help inform my work so that my work would be more useful. Until about 15 years ago, I think it would be, mid, until mid to late 90s, I worked predominantly in the area of breast cancer, but became acutely aware that no, at that time, in the mid to late 90s, no one was doing anything for men with prostate cancer at all. It was just terrible. And so I took it upon myself to go around and meet with every urologist in town and say, tell me what we should be doing. And that started, I guess, what's become the main focus of my work, which is looking at uh, what support groups can do to help men and their partners better, what nurses can do, what psychologists to do, and, and have continued to do that. And so I guess in the course of that work, I've got to try and play with different ways of helping, and it's led me to some conclusions about uh, what might be useful and what might not. But my big disclaimer about everything I say is that the real expert on your prostate cancer experience is actually you. You know what this is like. You've been there, walked that road, and you also know yourself better than anybody else does. So psychology and coping tips and all this business is not like a bacteria you can put under a microscope and go that is the truth of it and that is the fact of it. The benefit of this sort of talk and this sort of information is really in how well it works for you and how useful it is for you and if you don't like it you can just happily reject it and you'll find your own path. I guess is that, So that's my disclaimer over. My other disclaimer I'd have to say is that uh, invariably if I'm talking about how men cope and how women cope, I end up lapsing into stereotypes, which can be wrong for some people. So you're going to have to forgive me that, you know, men are like this and women are like this. But there are differences in how men and women typically cope with situations. And I think it's useful for us to acknowledge that there are differences um, both between different women and between different men and between the sexes. Because I think that in that perhaps lies the way to move forward and understand that that's actually okay. So the, when I was thinking about what might be useful for you today, I thought that we might just start about talking about what are the emotional, psychological aspects that seem to be important for men and for partners. And I think there's two ways to think about this. We need to think about um, you all as individuals, 
you know, the women as individuals and the men as individuals. And there are things that are going to be important and that are just yours, that are just about you thinking personally about what works for you and how you cope. And, and that's important to have that kind of boundary, I guess, and sense of separateness. But at the same time, there are things that are obviously important for you as a couple and things that are important to consider there in terms of moving forward as a couple through what is it undeniably a really difficult experience and working out as a couple how you're going to cope with that and how you're going to move forward and have life be as satisfying for you as it can be and to you know, meet the goals and expectations that you had. Because as you all know better than anyone, these things change after cancer. You know, you, before you get a cancer diagnosis, you're going on a track, you think you know what's happening and you can reasonably plan ahead. And then you get a cancer diagnosis and the world is just a bit different after that for most people, I think. And I know that personally from cancer in my family and I know that from the people I've worked with over the years. So that can mean a detour and a changed view and perspective on moving forward. And I think it's important for us to say that that's okay as well and that that is in fact part of life. The longer we live, the more likely it is that difficult things can happen to us and can change our path and that we need to kind of incorporate that information into our world view as we move forward. Oops, wrong way. Too fast, there we go. So I'll start by just talking about a framework for understanding coping with a stressful event. And uh, these have, there's been many psychologists over the decades who've come up with these. Now, I think the point of having a framework or a map is that certainly in the early days of a cancer diagnosis, it can be a really bewildering time where you can feel quite shocked and confused and it's difficult to comprehend what's ahead of you and to understand what's, what's ahead. And so the idea of a framework like this is just to go, aha, uh -huh, that might be why I'm feeling that way and this is what that's about. And I just think that it can help understand a bit about what you're going through. And if you understand it, first of all, that can make it easier to move on to the next step of, oh, okay, if that's what's happening to me, what can I do about it and how can I help myself to manage the situation better? So this particular map, I, ca I came across this a good 20 years ago when I first started working in cancer and I, would, I was running support groups and I would go to my support group and I'd say, look what I found this week, let's look at it and see if it was any good. And we'd turf a lot of them out and say they were a bit silly and not helpful. But the people that I was working with then thought that this was a useful way to look at the experience of cancer. And since then I've had similar feedback, so I hope it might be helpful to you. So if you think about cancer, and there are, this might not just be cancer, I mean stressful things happen to us all our lives. So you can get divorced, you can lose your job. If you're very naughty, you might go to jail. There's a whole lot of, diff you know, have a car crash, a whole lot of difficult stressful events can happen to us. And cancer is a difficult stressful event. It's a lot, major life stress. So I think it's useful to think about it that, first of all, to get it in some perspective. Because as you go through life, you will encounter stressful events and you'll learn how to deal with them. That's how you, you stay alive. And so you will have learnt things about yourself and your own strengths and the way you typically cope with things that can help you in your cancer experience. So remembering that and keeping that perspective, but then thinking, well, what is it about cancer that makes it a major life stress? And of course, we're talking about prostate cancer here, but uh, there may be people in the room who've had other cancers as well, that this often happens. So first of all, it's a threat to survival. And many people have told me that the minute they heard the word cancer, the first thing they thought was, am I gonna die? And if I am, when am I gonna die? And it feels like it's a very immediate thing. Not everybody feels that way, but certainly some people do. So the whole idea of a cancer diagnosis is a threat to your survival. It can be a threat to your lifestyle because the next thing you might worry about is, am I going to be able to keep working? Can I still play golf? Can I still run marathons? Can I still do trekking? Can, can we still get in the caravan and do our tour we were planning to do in the north? Are these things going to change? Am I going to be able to live the same lifestyle as I had before? And then it's a threat threat to sense of self. And in the case of prostate cancer, we know that treatments for prostate cancer have, have negative effects on sexual functioning. And so they can have enormous impacts on men and the way they feel about their masculinity and their self-image. And I've had many men tell me um, these stories over the years that I've been working in prostate cancer, that it really came as a blow. Uh, and 
that getting their heads around the changes in their sexuality has been a really difficult thing to take as a man. And I think it's important to acknowledge that, that that's a really hard thing and it's something that can happen. And then finally, a threat to relationships because some people will worry about what does this mean to my intimate relationship? If I'm single, what does it mean about forming relationships in the future? And these are all things that may occur to you and then what happens when they occur to you is you can get into a thinking spiral of worrying about them, catastrophizing about them and perhaps not thinking about them in the most helpful way. So I guess that's my point in saying these are the parts of life that a cancer diagnosis can threaten and it can lead to thinking in ways that that hinder you rather than help you um, as a way of mapping out what this is like. Does that make any sense? Okay. So this, this stress response picture is um, a very common one that's used and it's used often to talk about what happens if you're a caveman and a lion stands in front of you because it's the standard stress response thing. So that um, it's useful for us to have a response to stress because it helps us keep ourselves safe if we happen to be a caveman in a cave threatened by a dangerous animal. Because what happens is that we get an immediate thought, which might be that lion is going to, or that tiger is going to eat me. And then we immediately feel intensely anxious. Our adrenal glands pump out hormones that raise our blood pressure, make our heart rate faster. Uh, make our stomach stop working, make our gut stop working, make our pupils dilate, do all these things to get us ready to either run or to fight. So that's the standard fight or flight mechanism. And that's uh, the physical reaction there that happens in that um, little diagram. So saber-toothed tiger, oh my god it's going to eat me, I'm really scared, my body gets ready for action and I run or I fight. And it's it looks like a really simple diagram. No one really knows kind of which comes first, but we know that they're, all these things are linked. Because if you saw an animal and you thought it was a pleasant creature that you might pat, you wouldn't have that reaction. But when you perceive it as something that's going to eat you, get ready to run. And if you're a caveman, indeed, you would do something like that. So the thing about a major life stressor like cancer is that the body doesn't really differentiate between cancer and a tiger in that sense. So if your body thinks that your survival is threatened, what you get is a similar response, only there's kind of no way to, way to run really, although some, pe some of us might try and run. I'm a bit of a fleer. <laughs> I'd probably have a shot at taken off to the beach or something. But you can't really run, can you? Because you've got to do something about it. And you can't really fight because if you hit the doctor, that won't end well for you. <laughs> well, it won't end well. So got hormones running around your body, you're all pumped up, what do you do about it? So what often happens is we just feel bad, we feel anxious, we stomp about, we might yell at each other, we might withdraw. There's all sorts of things we might do that are a normal reaction when we can't fight and we can't flee. But they don't help us really, they don't help us talk to our partner about what's going on, they don't help us make a plan, they don't help us sit more calmly in the doctor's surgery and talk things through. It's an unhelpful thing. So the idea behind uh, the approaches to helping people cope with cancer have mostly been based on this sort of model. And you know, often you might hear people talk about oh, it was a cognitive behavioural approach or whatever. There's all sorts of fancy words for this stuff. And that's the approach that you know, most of the literature shows, help, shows helps. But it's really about understanding that this happens and trying to work on managing your thoughts in a way that's more helpful and perhaps doing exercises and things that will help with your physical reaction because you can calm down that physical reaction There's, and I'll be talking about some strategies for that and uh, acknowledging feelings and letting those feelings out when it's appropriate and dealing with that in that way and doing some problem focused coping, some actions that will help you rather than hinder you. So that's kind of the framework and the principle and um, I find it personally helpful myself when coping with stressful events and I've had lots of people tell, telling me it's helpful although I have to say my one funny story about that was I, try, I have a daughter who's 20 driving me crazy, so she's beautiful but she's a 20 year old, that's what they're like and um, she was upset about something once and I decided as a good psychologist I would explain this to her and then I would help her challenge her unhelpful thoughts and she looked at me, little thing, she was about 10, put her hands on her hips and said where was your helpful thinking when you lost your gold earrings in the swimming pool because <laughs> I was hysterical. <laughs>